Uh, my name is Alec Perry. I am a consultant operating out of the Air Office here in the southwest of Scotland, and this is Managing Slurry for Folks in a Hurry. And this is webinar two of the farm of the uh, the Farming and Water Scotland um, initiative, brought to you in association with the Farm Advisory Service. And uh, tonight, I'm joined by my colleague uh, Seamus Murphy, uh, by colleagues Bill Crooks and by Hugh McClement from the Royal Crichton Farm at Dumfries. So many of you will be aware um, and uh, will have come across using Zoom before, but if we have any questions as we go throughout the webinar tonight, um, just uh, you'll be able to, to use the chat function, the raise your hand if you feel very strongly that you want to, to speak when you're asking a question, and uh, store up your, your questions in the Q&A chat function and uh, we'll get Bill and you to answer as we go. Um, obviously, for, uh, for those who came to the first webinar, you'll be aware that there are some big changes with Slurry coming down the line and it's important that we stay ahead of that uh, as, uh, as things develop. The uh, goal of last week was to look at slurry storage and potential funding avenues to, to increase storage capacity on the farm. This week, it's very much evaluating the, the nutrient value of your, far, uh, your farm slurry and uh, waste products. So we're, uh, we're going to get kicked off here with, uh, with Bill Crooks, um, who's going to be talking about uh, assessing the, the nutrient value of your slurry. Bill, can you hear us? I can, yeah. Can you got me? Perfect. Yep. Are you able to share your screen, Bill? I'm about to do that. Right. So yes. So I've been asked to talk about slurry and management usage. Okay. So the central driver behind this talk uh, for me uh, and is occupying me quite a bit is this change, the proposed changes to the legislation governing um, slurry management. And as Alex said, anyone who's managing slurry and really needs to pay attention to that. I believe the consultation is open for another month or so, um, and it's going to have some some very direct impacts on, um, on on farming across Scotland. Okay, uh, mainly a bit of catch up for those people outside NVZs who who will need to who, um, to come into compliance in terms of storage capacity, etc. Um, and as part of that is understanding and making use of those slurries uh, and, and and the timing being a central part of that. Okay. Um, so the move towards the legislation is trying to increase or to avoid the requirement to spread through the winter. Okay, um, that's been a message. I don't think that'll be any surprise to anyone. It's been a message that's been focused on for quite a number of years now, uh, but we now see the legislation coming up to sort of back that up. Okay, so it's a, it's about when you spread, um, not about how much you spread or what, or the location of spreading. It's well partly about that, but it's it's mainly about timing. OK, um, and and part of that to be more technical about it is spreading when you have a, a target key growth stages in the front end. OK, and over the growing season. So it's being about innovative, about when we apply and um, and the purposes for applying. OK, so being very specific, we're applying slurries now to, um, to address a crop requirement and we're in trying to ensure that it's spread at a time of year when it will be used most efficiently. OK, and that might require the integration of spreading with crop production. OK, so being thinking outside the box a bit, I know we'll hear a bit from Hugh about that. OK, being innovative, um, not just accepting standard practice, uh, being aware of what other opportunities to make use or more efficient use of slurry. Uh, the biggest driver is the, the reduction of impact on soil health and water quality. OK, there's uh, those are the two big things that are, are underpinning um, increased focus on, on efficient slurry management. Uh, first off, this I put this quickly in. First priority is should you be on a slurry system? That just went in, just as was was before I headed in the conversation, because it is something which I think a lot of people will need to make sure they are happy with their business and make that as a fundamental business decision now. Okay, as we see potential changes in legislation, um, some people that answer maybe that slurry system isn't the most appropriate for your business going forward, um, but it's important to ask that question. Okay. And before we talk about spreading anything to land, including slurry, is making sure the land condition is suitable. Okay, so and for me, that's top of my list is drainage. Okay, making sure the land's fit for purpose. So that's to do with the timing in terms of the crop that you're growing, you're, you're applying to, but also making sure the land's in good shape. We only want to apply to land that has a crop requirement that's capable of producing. 
Okay. Um, second or next one is soil tests. If the land's worth spreading slurry to, then it's worth getting soil tested. Okay. And I do base I do really strongly believe that we're applying a fertilizer, not a soil improver. We're not disposing of something. We're applying a fertilizer, and as such, you should have the land tested so you understand where you are in terms of pH, phosphate, and potassium. And I do think that's going to be uh, potentially quite an increased scrutiny. On, on just the decision-making process when it comes to land spreading organics, okay? And part of that is, is having the soil test so that you can back up your decisions in terms of spreading. Um, <clears throat> as with all fertilizer, slurry needs to be applied when there's a crop demand. There's a specific rule, GBR, General Binding Rule 18, I believe it is, that specifies that you should only be applying to a uh, land that has a specific crop requirement. So, um, and part of that is the timing. Okay, uh, Hugh will know and other people know that spring's been defined for people in NVZ. So those farmers in NVZs know that there's closed periods, okay, where you cannot apply organic materials. And those are defined based upon where you are in Scotland, okay, and, and to, in some degree your farming system. Uh, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to see that sort of across Scotland, but certainly that's something that's been done in other parts of Scotland to try to make sure that spreading activities are focused on crop production and minimizing the risk to the environment, okay? And then growing season. So making sure that we're looking at slurry spreading as something that can occur throughout the growing season, particularly uh, to be sympathetic with crop cycles. So I know that's the case in uh, spreading after the first cut or the second cut in some cases, and certainly to support grazing, okay? And the back end spreading. I think that's where you're gonna see the pressure now is anyone who's relying upon or targeting most of their spreading activities towards the back end, I think that will be increasingly difficult to do with the changes in legislation. The focus is trying to make sure you're spreading when there's a crop requirement, and that's usually the spring and during the summer months. Um, and changes in spreading technology. So there's a challenge there. Again, I know he was here coming to this talk, so I, I know he did that a couple of years ago, okay, to try to grow a crop without any bagged fertilizer, okay? And that's his challenge. And I think that if you spend time with uh, technology and understanding the timing of your fertilizer application rate, that's just something that perhaps most farmers should be thinking about because that will require you to think about timing and to possibly be flexible in terms of how you apply um, in order to, to, to support a, a whole crop, okay? And then finally, it's precision spreading too. And that's something which we don't have time tonight to really define, uh, but it is something too, it's, and that's technology. So the dribble bars, um, the trailing shoes. There is other technology such as shallow injection, but I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but we'll have to see what the actual definition of precision spreading technique or technology is. Okay. Uh, but again, that's important too, particularly if you're looking at uh, making a substantial investment in the near future in spreading technology. Um, I'm the <clears throat> one big document that I would, I'm going to promote tonight and as part of this talk is the four point plan. Okay. <clears throat> Very useful for benchmarking. Um, it might have been discussed in the previous ones already because it does contain information about sort of book values for slurry production values, okay? Um, and most any sort of regulatory system that we see coming into play will make use of similar approach, okay? So it's calculated volumes of slurry based on standard figures, okay? Uh, and it's very likely that you saw that as part of your previous talk, but the same approach is useful for understanding nutrients, okay? And that's freely available uh, and it can be a very useful tool. Um, the other technique, the other one I'm talking about tonight is uh, technical note 650. So that's application or optimizing the application of bulky organic fertilizers. Okay, so again, a freely available resource that lists a wide range of organic materials and their nutrient value. So again, it's a useful tool for lookup purposes. And it's an important tool for that first approach to understanding how much slurry you're producing and how you're using it efficiently. I also am gonna promote slurry analysis, okay? It's a very useful tool. It doesn't have to be done very often, um, usually only once uh, every couple of years perhaps, or when you have a significant change to your management system, okay? Generally, these values don't change too much within the system, but it's worth having the, that, that number, okay? Um, in the first instance, it can help it identify some efficiency values. So dry matter content is pretty crucial to me. So if someone approaches me with a slurry analysis at 4% or lower dry matter content, my first question back to them is, is are you using, are you spreading that efficiently? Okay, is your system efficient that such that it produces a 4% dry matter content or should you be looking to get that content up a bit higher? Okay, so that you're, you're not spreading dirty water or unless you have to. Okay, so it's about understanding what you're spreading and making sure it's efficient because of course there'll be savings on diesel 
as well as, as saving on our, our pr protecting your soils by spreading less less material than is absolutely necessary. Okay, and then finally potash too. That comes as, in terms of the analysis. Most often than not, it's underestimated just how much potash is in slurry. Okay, and your sometimes your slurry analysis is what's needed to really be confident that there's that much potash there because their savings can be made. Okay. <clears throat> And on the slurry sampling, it should be taken as spread. Okay, so there's a lot of dilution and other activities that are needed to get a, the slurry moving to get it into the tanker. So you want to make sure that that's taken into consideration when you take the sample. Okay, because you're looking for one that, as it is, leaving the tanker and into the field. Um, the key nutrient that we're going to be focusing on, um, one of the reasons why we're choosing a change in legislation, is nitrogen. Okay, it's of key environmental concern. It's driven a lot of environmental protection legislation associated with agriculture in the past, and it will continue to do so in the future. Uh, it's a key nutrient that's easily lost. I think anyone who's been managed uh, in grassland systems will know that nitrogen can be a very fickle uh, nutrient to manage. Okay, so it is lost, easily lost to the environment, and that is where our concern largely lies in terms of environmental protection, is just how easily it's lost. Okay, um, the general acceptance is that it's most used most efficiently by spreading slurry in the spring. And I think we all have to accept that. There's a lot of chat and a lot of discussion about different timings in relation to nitrogen use efficiency. But in general, the argument is that if you can spread it in the spring, you're going to be using it most efficiently, okay? And now I've used some of this table very specifically because another part of this whole change that we're seeing is we all need to become a little bit more familiar with some of the terminology that's used to describe slurry management. So we have, a, for example, the dry matter content here. I've got two samples here, both at 10%. Okay, that's slightly high, but still pumpable. Okay, um, so probably a, a good target, but at the higher end, perhaps. Okay, um, we've got the incorporation type. Okay, so again, this can vary. If we change our approach to how we apply slurry, that can impact how efficiently we're using our nutrients. We don't have time tonight to cover all the different application technologies, but just so you know, that is a factor, okay? It does have a role in how well we understand uh, nitrogen use or nutrient use efficiency specifically for nitrogen, okay? We then have soil type and that can vary as well, okay? In terms of nitrogen use in particular, in this example, I've got all other minerals, which covers most of our sandy loams and, uh, sorry, 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 clay loams and sandy clay loams and uh, any sort of clay-based soils. Uh, and then we have our sandy loans. Okay, there's a few other categories as well, um, but I've just covered these two tonight, mainly to demonstrate that there can be an impact. Okay, so we do see a change here in terms of nitrogen use efficiency based upon our soil type. Okay. Um, the next one is phosphate. Again, a key environmental concern. Uh, so it's received a lot of attention in the past and it's in general, it's increased by loss by winter spreading, and that's been a central concern um, to uh, agencies like SEPA, uh, as well as Cisco, uh, is, is, is this the, how much is lost by surface runoff in the, in the, in, by spreading under wet conditions or poor conditions, okay? Um, and also, we need to recognize that phosphate is heavily regulated in other European countries. We don't have that in the UK. There's a few mentions of phosphate in the various legislation uh, implements that are out there that govern agriculture, but in general, it's not been focused on. Um, but we need to be aware that in other European countries, it is, it is heavily regulated, and many farming activities are um, controlled or restricted based upon the, the phosphate content of organic fertilizers. Um, and it, I think for us in Scotland, the, the key part is to test your soils, okay, to make sure that you're staying at <coughs> or below target for phosphorus. And that's really how you can demonstrate that you're managing phosphorus sufficiently by having a soil test that's that's showing you you're on target or moving towards target. Um, and you can expect about a 50% efficiency. So when you're using phosph when you're when you're looking, you're doing your sums for phosphate application from slurry, it's about a 50% efficiency that we're looking for. That's the benefit to the crop in the year of application. Finally, the, in terms of the key nutrients involved, potash. Okay, we don't typically consider it as an environmental concern, and I don't think that's going to change. Okay. Um, but it's often over applied, okay, and there are some savings possible, mainly through soil and some slurry analysis and recognizing and be confident that you're actually applying a lot of potash so that you can pull back on the bag. And we are looking at a fairly high efficiency ratio for, for applied uh, uh, potash from slurries as well, okay, so that's about 90% efficiency, so that it is a pretty closed system. So provided you're aware of and managing your, 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 your potash with some knowledge, 
you can uh, have some savings by pulling back on the on bagged fertilizer. Okay. Other benefits, sulfur, essential plant nutrient. Okay, we don't often talk about sulfur deficiency in particularly in grassland systems because there generally is so much kicking around. Um, but, but slurry is an excellent source of sulfur. Um, and also all systems now need to be aware that sulfur could be emerging as a micronutrient or macronutrient deficiency because of atmospheric improvement in atmospheric protection. So we're not seeing as much deposited from environmental pollution. So again, it's a, it's a plant nutrient that we all need to be aware of. It's, we've, we've been allowed to ignore it because there's been good sources from environmental pollution, but that's coming to an end now. So again, sulfur is an excellent source of sulfur. Um, it can be other beneficial micronutrients, but it really is tied to uh, how efficiently you're managing that slurry, okay? Because you can talk about micronutrients, availability and slurry, but as soon as you start to get all away from that higher dry matter, it's really quite tightly, tightly linked to dry matter. So if you get down into your four and 2%, then you're talking about relatively small amounts. So um, the micronutrients, uh, you know, availability from these types of materials is generally related to the dry matter content. Um, right. So the, the, the fine thing is scenario based, okay, because uh, this is what we're going to have to be doing, okay. This is all comes from the four point plan and a combination of the technical notes uh, 650. And so for 100 cow dairy cattle, that's 45 cube of slurry weekly, that's 180 cubes of slurry monthly. If you use the values in the technical note, that's about 1,000 kilograms of nitrogen, 520 of phosphate, and 920 kilograms of potash per year. And the reason I've put these numbers up is just to demonstrate that those values are there, okay? These aren't things that you need to calculate. You know, there's the, 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 those resources are available, and they're very useful when it comes to getting just a rough idea of how efficiently you're using your nutrients, because that's where we're going to be seeing increasing pressure now from both not only from regulators, but also from the market. OK, so quality assurance schemes, large scale clients, they're going to be looking to see that the industry is being cut using nutrients as efficiently as possible. So having these types of numbers to hand um, can be a good initial way of uh, making sure or getting a handle on just how efficient you are. OK, and that's just a screen grab from the technical note showing total in uh, phosphate and potash production based on a whole wide range of different livestock units. Okay, so these are the kind of numbers that will be used when it comes to evaluating um, how much slurry and the value of that slurry in terms of its nutrient content you have on your farm. Um, so first steps, so calculating slurry production. Okay, that is, I think most people would automatically think you need to, you have a, you need to have a, a, um, a meter on the slurry spreader. Okay, and I've seen that but I've never seen it carried through efficiently. So I've seen it as an initially good project, but it doesn't often make its way from the farm gate or from the field gate into the main farm business uh, software program or whatever you're using for farm management. I don't see that happening much. Um, so it's something that I'm less reliant upon. Um, it's certainly a lot of contractors or some contractors have spent money to get meters. And if they're, they're there, it's certainly worth asking. Uh, but I believe that the first step for anybody is to is to use the numbers at a, at a farm level, okay? Based on livestock unit types, you have your IX map, so you know how much land you have. You can start to get a pretty pretty good idea of your spreading rates based upon that approach, okay? Um, and it might need to be modified when you take into consideration dry matter content, et cetera, okay? But you can get a good sense at a farm level of just what your spread rates are and also where those nutrients are going, okay? And it's to produce this farm gate nutrient budget. There was, we used to do quite a bit of this some by time back, but I think it's coming back on the, on the agenda now. Okay, so looking at your farm at a higher level and seeing what your, your total nutrient movement is across the farm unit is probably is the first step. Okay, um, in my opinion, in my experience, most farm businesses are not over applying nutrients. So when you do do your evaluation at a high level, you're unlikely to find anything that's sort of saying we've got a massive disparity in nutrient use efficiency. So you're not like you're going to end up with too much of any individual nutrient coming in. Most systems are pretty efficient. It's it's the efficiency due to spreading practices where most prop, you know, where we fall down. Okay, is that loss through the winter months from winter spreading in the winter where we don't know how much nutrients were lost from surface runoff. Okay, the question marks associated with spreading practices and then direct loss to the environment due to timing. Okay, and that can be just this time of year, but also <clears throat> timing in season. Okay, so how close to the last rainfall or how is, is there heavy rain expected in the next 24 hours? These are all things which will reduce efficiency if they're not taken into consideration. 
And there's this final what, one final statement is that there's always going to be this disproportionate environmental impact from spreading over winter versus the economic value as a fertilizer. We can calculate it. It is a valuable fertilizer, but we need to recognize that that's not the only important element to this whole discussion. It slurry when it gets into the environment has a it can have a devastating impact on the environment, which is why there is so much interest in, and and um, scrutiny on what how we're managing slurries. Okay, so there'll always be this um, this this uh, disproportionate uh, value versus the economic or the uh, the environmental impact, and we need to remember that. Okay, uh, when it comes to managing our slurries and in what particularly when it comes to investing in 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 effect efficient uh, fertilizer management. Uh, key next steps. I, I, as I said before, I think end use efficiency is going to be the next target. Okay, it'll be from the regulators as well as from as industry. I think there's the tools are out there for them to start putting in goals that you can or into us as an industry might be needed or might be required to meet. Okay, so based upon some of the values that we have at our hands or our fingertips, they can start to ask questions about how efficiently you're using nutrients, and we need to be prepared to do that. We need to be able to have it on paper to sort of answer those questions. Okay, increased scrutiny on the type and timing of nitrogen fertilizer usage, and that's just, slurry is obviously one of them, but I, again, we've seen some talk about urea, for example, okay, and I think we might see increasing uh, uh, scrutiny on its uses, and part of that will be on, on slurries as well, okay. Phosphate will continue to emerge as an issue in relation to efficient slurry management. It's always going to be there, just below the surface, and we need to be on target, and particularly in relation to soil testing of your land to make sure that phosphorus is not an issue in terms of high levels in the soil itself. And then finally, precision spreading. Okay, that's going to be the next part of it. Um, it could be, I'm not sure what's happening now with, uh, there was some talk about maybe having some flexibility regarding buffer strip. If you have used precision technology, I'm not sure how much of that will be carried through in the legislation, but there's certainly been a lot of talk about the fact that if we're using precision techniques, so that's dribble bars and trailing shoes, where we can control the actual spread pattern, then we may have some flexibility in terms of regulatory controls, but buffer strips, et cetera, okay? Oops. Um, and I think the main message for here is that if you wanna save money, um, you have to pull back on the bag, okay? You're not gonna make any money uh, or save from the efficient use of slurries and financially, unless the only way to save that is by not applying bag fertilizer, okay? And that will always be the first and foremost in terms of trying to use it efficiently is making sure that as little as possible is coming out of the bag and the most as possible is coming from your, your slurries. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Is that okay? Thanks very much, Bill, that, that was really good. Um, can, uh, can I just ask, uh, maybe be interesting to, to see how many of the, the audience are actively uh, testing for the their, their slurry um, i wonder whether you could uh, maybe uh, raise your hand uh, or uh, or put in the chat just to give us an indication of uh, how many of you are actively uh, managing slurry okay uh, and uh, well thanks thanks very much bill um up next, uh, we've, we've got Hugh uh, McClement uh, from the, the Royal Crichton, um, going to give us a bit of an overview of what goes on on the farm and uh, what his general approach is to, to slurry management and some of the, the changes that, uh, that he's made to, uh, to, to his outlook and the outlook of his team um, and what he sees going forward. Um, can I just take this chance before Hugh starts as well to remind you all to um, please uh, put your questions um, in the, the Q&A and uh, we'll, we'll pick up on them once, uh, once we've finished with Hugh's presentation. Okay, doke. All right, Hugh, can you hear me? I can hear you, Alex, can you hear me? Perfect, yep, here right, we go. So, so we'll assume everybody else can hear it, yep. can hear me and uh, welcome everybody and Thank you, Alex, for asking me along here tonight to talk on a subject that uh, I seem to have spent a lifetime handling and, and, and still doesn't get any, any easier and, and, and it's still quite smelly, but never mind. Interesting there, Bill, I've learned just quite a bit just in, in, in your talk, so that was useful for me. I did some calcs on the figures there and it's scary the amount of slurry, but uh, next slide, Alex, and I'll give a wee bit of background to me and what I do. So I manage the SRUC South and West Dairy Farms. So that consists of the Barony Farm uh, now. I've been 
running, uh, <clears throat> handled the charge of managing that farm for the last two years now, presently milking 200 cows through a parlour. There used to be a robot, but I uh, uh, disposed of it last year, so all cows are milked through the parlour. <clears throat> There's approximately, as we speak at the moment, and this was counted last week at the end of the financial year, the number of cows, so 30 dry cows and heifers. And Crichton Royal, where I've been for too many years now, it's approaching 42 years I've been at Crichton, so I uh, a bit of experience there. Milking 195 through the parlour there, uh, and at Acrehead, there's 130 going through the parlour and, and 50 going through a robot milker there. And carrying, as it says there, approximately 75 dry coos and heifers. And uh, something that's quite uh, important here, we have three separate milk accounts with Arla. I'm very fortunate we have an Arla contract for all three farms. Crichton and Acrehead, as it says, are on a Morrison's contract, which is also part of an Arla 360 contract. And those of you that maybe are in the, in the audience that know anything about Arla 360 and the Arla uh, model, they are very focused on climate now and climate check and doing carbon footprint and, and very much the subject matter tonight fits into all of that. And uh, more important, well, at, at, at Barony, <clears throat> it's very much a standardised uh, uh, constituent contract we're on there, so it doesn't get the enhanced payment for being on a at 360. But just to let you know, the average milk sales per cow over the three herds is about 10,500 kilograms of cow. So fairly intensive input-output system. Next slide, please, Alex. So yes, last week, uh, this is genuine figures, folks. Across the three farms, 680 adult cows, and then the replacements coming on, 210 dairy heifers, 213, uh, up between 13 and 24 months, just coming up to Cavan, and 213 under 12 months. I forgot to, uh, and I omitted uh, uh, to put in there <clears throat> bull calves and beef calves, and there's probably about 70 uh, beef calves we have now, and only two male black and white calves. And what a change that's been just, again, about uh, managing uh, every calf as a value is a, is a theme that Arla have but uh, reducing male black and white calves on the farm and higher value to go in into the, into the beef chain. Also some sheep, 480 Scotch meal ewes. They're nearly all finished lambing now. There's only a handful left. And we have 78 barony red deer hinds, and that's in a joint venture with a third party. The land mass that I'm under management at the moment is 300 hectare at Barney. Half of that's owned, another half rented. And at Crichton, similar area, but all rented there. Next slide, please. So the crops grown on the southwest farms, and this is barony, folks. Just to kind of give you a feel, I'm, I'm trying to give you a broad brush what, uh, uh, what what's all grown on the farm and how we utilise slurry. So 240 hectares of grass is for grazing and silage making, predominantly silage making. There is a bit of grazing with young stock and obviously all the sheep graze. And, and, and the cows do graze for probably about 12 hours during the day uh, after first cut silage like so. And uh, as it says there, a three cut system, we'll know the first cut at Barney till about the end of May, but all that land that, that's destined for, for silage will have received 30 cube to the hectare or 3,000 gallon per acre prior to each cut. All that was applied already uh, in mid-March at, at Barney for the silage ground. The sheep grazing land got, again, this, magic figure 30 cubed to the hectare early January and, and that basically there was to try and encourage grass growth so I had grass available for sheep uh, with lambs and it was the weather was suiting. I don't put any slurry on the deer land it's too far away but uh, looking at it tonight when I was passing by it's maybe starting to look a wee bit tired so it maybe just need but it's very difficult to to get a slurry there and, and more importantly maybe need to be some solid FYM in time to come. Winter cereals, uh, this is the first year that this is practice at Barney. I've done it for a number of years at Crichton. Well, we've applied 30 cube to the hectare again this 3,000 cube, 3,000 gallon to the acre. That was mid-March, uh, put on the dribble bar and then two split applications of nitrogen in the shape of urea. So again March and then a, a further dressing of 50 kilograms at N at late April. This has all been applied and, and all the grassland has been applied. Uh, urea was inhibitor this year, the first time 
I've used that. We've done a lot of research work at Crichton we're using an inhibitor, uh, an extra cost in putting that inhibitor on. And, and as Bill mentioned earlier, there is a bit of debate about urea. So I decided I would try the inhibitor, a, an additional cost. But I think I've, I've, I've won the battle because the farm is certainly looking a, much healthier as an observation at the moment. So 65 kilograms of AIN a, at Barney in late March, all done. And then that's all for the first cut. And then uh, 50 kilograms of N, and that'll come in the shape of ammonium nitrate uh, for the second and third cuts. And equally so, those second and third cuts will receive 30 cube to the hectare of slurry. So a total purchased N, and I'll take on board what Bill, as you said, N applied to silage grass, 165 kilograms of N. And those of you the year that were still working in units to the acre, it's only 130 units to the acre. So it's not a very high input of N. And N is something, that, as Bill said there, very much under scrutiny, like you know, but but grass needs it needs something to make it grow. Slurry can do it, but but you do need a wee bit of addition. Next slide, please, Alec. Crichton, I all of Crichton land sits within an NVZ, so that does bring as Bill uh, described earlier in his talk, the guidelines associated with an NVZ. Basically, we shut a uh, uh, go into a closed period due to our sandy soils on Crichton, uh, on grassland at, uh, <clears throat> at, the end of, no, sorry, at the end of August, yep. And uh, so we can't apply then basically till we hit the January period and uh, we try and minimise anything. It only would be a, 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 a desperate rush due to running out of storage if we had to go on in January, February, but we try and once the ground starts to dry up and, and we can see we'll start to apply then. So a five cut system, uh, of, of silage making at, at Crichton, all receiving this, again, this magic figure of 30 cube to the hectare, 3,000 gallon acre prior to each cut. Winter cereals, I have been doing that for a number of years now. Messy job. I even had uh, somebody here filming that for a uh, farm advisory service on, on Friday when we were still applying it. That was the last of the application going on to winter wheats. And uh, yes, it, it's, uh, it can be a wee bit messy, but how you see a response from that growing crop, again, of putting on this uh, nutrient base of, of slurry. Again, again, it needs a, a winter cereal crop. This is grown for whole crop cereal silage. Does need N uh, out of the bag. So I've targeted this 50 kilograms of N early March, and then there's another dressing to get late April. And that'll go on in the shape of ammonium nitrate. I haven't bought it yet, Mike, but I'll have to get that organized. Maize, I've no maize in the ground and, and good old Facebook reminded me yesterday I'd, I was planting maize a year ago yesterday. It's a much colder spring at the moment and uh, I'm just starting to get ready to plough probably by the end of the week uh, and ploughing down a cover crop of grass. It's been graced with heifers and I'm going to apply, it, it got 30 cube to the hectare in late February and I've had a decent, decent grazing bite of grass there as a cover crop. But uh, I'm going to put th another 30 cubic hectare on top of the ploughing prior to drilling. This is a wee bit innovative stuff. The uh, uh, contractors doesn't like it because it obviously makes us, the, the soil uh, contaminated with slurry. But I like, I think it puts, and again, experience has showed me, I'm putting nutrients right where I'm going to uh, plant that seed and then uh, and, and, and gives that seed an, an excellent start. And then it'll go down into that cover crop that's been ploughed down which will give me another green uh, manure base there along with previous slurry. So that's how I'm, I'm trying to endorse major use of, of maize growing using slurry and, and hasten to add no bag fertilizer at all for my maize. Silage ground, again, the urea inhibitor applied at this 145 kilograms to hectare early March and then ammonium nitrate will go on for the second and third cuts and uh, no purchased end for fourth and fifth. That's all grown using slurry, basically. And again, total purchased N, similar to Barony, 130 units to acre, 165 kilograms of N per hectare. Alec, next slide, if possible. So back to Bill and I, we didn't confer on this, folks, but regular testing the soil every four years is what I try and adopt. Uh, and I've just received today all, all of Crichton land, which was, was just tested, basically, in the, in the early part of the year from January into February. I've just received that data today. I would love to have had it last night when I put this presentation together.
But anyway, I've, I've got some data from uh, November from Barony. But Ghost was out saying, uh, you need to test it. You need to, you can't manage it uh, if you don't measure it. pH is crucial. And, and I'm going to say six. No doubt the technical notes will maybe say 6.2, but I live in the real world. If I can aim for six, for pH of six, that, uh, that's, that's as near as damn it. But uh, as you're well aware, it, we, we, we all live in the real world and, and having the whole farm at a six is probably a dream, but uh, it's where we aspire to. But it needs to be in this area to allow the nutrient to uptake to work and nutrients in the shape of what you're putting on Basically, your slurries, they don't work really well unless you've got your pH right. And uh, that's well documented for everybody. Like I test for P and K, so I don't know where I'm going with this because I've not purchased any P and K at Crichton for the last 20 years. It's either been nutrients from slurry and basically straight N coming in the shape of your ear to start with and then going on to straight N there. And I'm starting to practice that at Barony too. It has worked for me at Crichton, so it should work out at, at, at Barney site too. Like so. Next slide, please, Alex. So this is a, a field at Barney, folks. I didn't show you the maps, but you can see there, uh, basically, if you look at the, the pH, which is the, the third column in for the left, and uh, I didn't make these up. This was a uh, soil sampling that was done by a partner organization at SEC Consultant, a work with called Soil Essentials. And as you can see there, I would think I'm, I'm meeting the average, certainly the part for one field S13, but the rest are all sitting 6.2. But more importantly, you can see the phosphate and potash. And I can only say I'm going to improve and not there, but the potash ones, I'm going to have to look at maybe uh, at some point, maybe uh, targeting them for a cut for an, an offtake. But I can certainly address that, and I'll come to that more in, 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 a, in a minute or two when I get further through, but this particular part of, the, of Barony Farm is rented. But last summer, I uh, installed two roadside, or sorry, under, under road crossings to allow me to get umbilical use onto this land, which I'd never seen umbilical before. So now I'm starting to spread evenly across all the farm and a bit more uh, strategic management of slurry. And I think what Bill said there too, all compliments, but it, it, it takes a, a fairly degree of management to get to achieve that like so. But again, that's just to kind of give you a, a snapshot, the information that's there, information's key, and you can't manage it unless you measure it. So that's one of my sayings. Alec, next slide. So analyze your farm nutrients. So test slurry, you, get, you will get variable results as, as, as Bill said. So it needs to be a, well, a very well mixed sample. Uh, so I would suggest that you mix your store, be it underground or above ground, it needs to be well mixed before you, you, you start to spread. That can either be through an over the top mixer or bubbler and, and whatever your system is, or, or, or even uh, through a jetter, which can create a bit of uh, uh, environmental issues there by, by, by jetting because you obviously get a bit of aerosol effect there like so you do that but anyway just to kind of reiterate again i've told you the kind of production level of our cows a 10,000 liter dairy cow or 10,000 kilogram dairy cow slurry is completely different to a suckler cow slurry so not all slurries are the same folks and the only way you'll ever get to that is my testing it fym I'm, i'll touch on it briefly but it's not a very easy subject to actually test, because it is obviously bulky, and how do you get a representative? But as uh, I've learned tonight, the technical note that Bill was promoting 650, I think we need to go into that probably and look at that, and that might be a better way of managing it, but it is very difficult there. And as you're all well, we're well aware, FYM takes a, a lot longer to break down in the soil for the microbes here to utilize and, and, and make, the, make that fertilizer work. Slurry is certainly much more easily Manage for the soil microbes. Alex, next slide. Now, this is something, and, and Bill touched on, and uh, this is information, folks, uh, that I achieved from a contractor I, I used down here who's got a John Deere Harvest Lab on board his 
12 meter dribble bar and he can give me the information there. These were snapshots. Obviously the Crichton one was on the left. The dry matter at 5.4% and nitrogen level at 2.9 kilograms per cube. And as you can see, obviously phosphate levels and potash levels and the ammonium nitrogen there. Again, this is done by an NIR a, a sensor on the actual a slurry a band spread, either the dribble bar as such. So it's analyzing that and continuously giving that information to the operator who can store it. And I can get the information back from him on that one there. And the reason I put the barony up against the Crichton, barony ships a lot of water. Uh, all the dirty water goes into slurry, whereas at Crichton, I, I tend to uh, manage dirty water separately. So the dry matter, as you can see, is, is, is slightly different. It's a bit wetter, obviously, at Barony. And you can see the slightly different analysis there, and that's to do, due to the dilution effect. And this is coming from an NIR uh, sensor on board, but I have taken samples at the same time and compared there and sent those away for analysis. And it's no a million miles away, so it's fairly robust. And I think this is the technology that's coming down the track. It's very expensive and it's on my Christmas list, wish list, whatever you go. But uh, uh, Alex and I spoke earlier in the year about uh, the, the grants uh, scheme that the Scottish government put out. I applied for that and I've managed to get a, a, a 12 meter new dribble bar on the back of that and with full metering equipment, which we've had before. But more importantly, I've and then in the building a new dribble bar, I'm making it harvest lab ready. And I think this is something that I'm going to have to look at for my own use, rather as obviously bringing the contractor in all the time. But this is information that's key and critical to running a farm business and how we manage slurry. And interestingly, it'll give you the, the, the amount applied per field and the breakdown of obviously all those components. And again, this is all about how you balance and manage your fields. Next slide, please, Alex. And now you go, this was, uh, again, I apologize about the, the, uh, the, the picture quality is a wee bit poor, but it, it was just me covering it and putting it onto a slide. But I asked this operator to apply a, a 30 cube to the hectare, or 30,000 uh, litres to the hectare, as you can see. He averaged 29.79, so I think I can't chase him for that. He achieved the goal, if you know what I'm saying. So that's volume. Actually, if I had more time than I, I could assure you, I could have broke that down to N and, and P and K applied like. And that's the field, those of you that have ever been to Scott Grass, it's in the front of from Acrehead Dairy Unit, which is to the uh, the, the left-hand side uh, there, and, and to the right-hand side, there's a, you can just see another building, that's where I live, so uh, it's where I look out on that field there. But uh, it just shows you how accurate the applications are being monitored, and this is information that's key that you can feed back to your, your business management of how you handle slurry. But it's only, my understanding, it's only available through John Deere at the moment. They are streets ahead of any other buddy on manure, on, on board manure analysis like so. Anyway, next slide, Alex. So yes, applications, splash plate, we've touched on that. It's soon to be banned. How are we going to cope? Well, I've got ideas, but uh, I didn't write the rules here and I'm just going to have to farm with the rules like everybody else. The dribble bar, that's our system. And I've now, as I said earlier, I've ordered a 12 meter bar. We have an old nine meter, which is going to go to one of the other farms. Trailing shoe I've tried. Uh, I think the dribble bar is probably the best, the optimum at the moment. Uh, trailing shoe does work. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not against it, but uh, there's more wearing parts there. And, and again, I think the dribble bar just it achieves a similar aims and, and, and goals. Shallow injection. I have a shallow injector, which I haven't disposed of yet. I think there's going to be a route for it, but it was always a very slow output. It was only three metres wide. Unless you were separating, it was always prone to blockages. And that wasn't a very, it wasn't ideal for the operator. Like so, but we did use it for separated liquid when we separated. Unfortunately, at the moment, I'm not separating, but it's on my to-do list to get that machine operational again. But I'm going to ask a question to everybody. How do we going to cope as farmers without a splash plate? Do we have alternatives? Well, I think there are alternatives. Those of it have a tanker at the moment. We should have embraced the, the grant scheme and there may be other things coming down the track, but either to put a, a, a very cheap dribble bar on the back of a tanker 
that would allow you to do your own uh, spreading. All the alternatives are then you have to bring me, if you don't have the facilities or your own equipment, you contract that in and, and, and you use a, a tankers and, and, and a boom tankers and, and use nurse tanks to get the far off fields. There is ways around this, but it, it is going to be costly and it's going to take a bit of planning and, 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 and management. Alex, I think there's no many more slides left. I'm conscious of time and one more. If you don't. So folks, yes, infrastructure is crucial. And, uh, and I mean infrastructure. I believe you were listening to Adrian Jones last week. Uh, Adrian was involved with me putting in an underground main at Crichton. I, way back in 1993-94, that's how far back we go of, of managing slurry, but that was putting in a, an underground main which allowed us to get to fields easier rather than laying out a, a flexible hose. We still use that today. And then since that, I've embraced more road crossings at Crichton. So across every road and an underground, and, and basically that's putting a large duct in there. We can pull, there's actually a fixed pipe underneath there now, but it allows you to cross roads safely. You don't work with ramps and stuff like that. And as I mentioned earlier, I've done barony, and what a difference that has allowed me now to, to spread uh, the, the area land out there that traditionally was done very, very inefficiently with tankers. And, and certainly umbilical has got to be the way forward. Like. So 90% of the Crichton farm is reachable or obtainable uh, with umbilical. The areas that we can't, then obviously we still have to look at uh, other means and that will be tanker. And if that's either a tanker with a, 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 a band spreader in the back, be it a dribble bar or whatever, or it's going to a nurse tank and then using the umbilical in the field. But there is ways and means, but yes, it, it comes at cost. And again, this is huge benefit just in the last 12 months at Barony. 75% of the Barony is now achievable with umbilical. And the far off land at uh, Barney across the river, because I'm, I'm certainly, I'm conscious, maybe steeper listening, so I'm not even going to en em embark on this one. I'm not going to lay a pipe across the river, eh? So I take my solid manure to cereal ground and then try and, and, and fertilise that with a solid factor there. And it, it's a much safer route, like so. But again, it's making best use of the nutrients on the farm. Next slide, Alex. This is the last one I hasten to add, folks. So what all this has achieved for me as a farm manager is that I have an even application of the nutrients produced in the farm across all the farm. It's not to the fields. And I remember as a boy, and I'm, I, that's a long time ago, I hasten to add, we used to only go to the dry fields that got slurry. Now every field gets slurry. Or, or FYM, but predominantly slurry. And that is, as Bill said, is making best use of the nutrients. It's a fertilizer and what that does for your farm. And you as a farmer benefit from that, but more important, your biggest asset in your farm is soil. It benefits from the nutrients that's in that. And if you test that slurry, then you know what you're, you, 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 well, you can measure it, you can manage it. So yes, I've kind of given you, I wish I'd showed you some photographs, but unfortunately they weren't just very good when they wouldn't have been very clear on this tonight, but all crops benefit from this attitude. It's not just grass, it is growing cereals. Spring crops can also benefit from it. And uh, we'll see what I, uh, my maize will get it prior to planting. I can't go down maize crops again with an umbilical system then. But finally, I'm going to use the word carbon. It's the big buzzword everywhere these days and farming is no different and that's the one we're all going to have to embrace. Uh, whether that be through our own farming systems and whether that be through uh, the government-led initiatives, but I can tell you my milk buyer is, is certainly doing carbon footprinting and uh, we've just conducted the first reference year last for, for last year. I'm about to fill in another climate check for the year that's just finished. And I would like to think hopefully we come out very credible in the first attempt. So hopefully now going forward, eh, there'll be it will bigger improvements. But this is the way we're going to have to manage, whether we like it or no, but this is going to be the way we're going to have to use our farms and our farms are going to be benchmarked. It's, it's carbon management, if that's the case. I think as farmers, whether we like it or not, and I hate to keep emphasizing that, we've got to embrace the environmental challenge. We have been bashed and bruised. I saw the bad people out there, but I'm not wanting to go there. I can't change the mindset of others, but we do need to be seen to be greener than green and, and, and basically embrace everything that we do 
and let the public see that we're doing it and doing it in a meaningful way. And my final saying, folks, that I would say in most of my talks would be, it's no what you hear, it's what you do with what you hear. And I'll leave it at that, Alex. Thank you all for listening. That's great. Um, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, I think uh, we'll, with uh, with that done there, we will just head straight into the to the open Q and A session. I can see there's a couple of questions there, uh, and uh, Seamus is going to act as moderator for us. Um, so we will just get kicked off with that. Seamus. Yeah, we've got a good few questions coming in, but keep keep them coming, and we'll try to get to as many as we can before close at around nine. Um, I'll start off with this one, which. Um, came in there. Do you think that we're looking at a future where all everyone will be under the same restrictions as MBZs are currently under? Who wants to take that? I'll, I'll, my, in, in, I'll I was going to say that's a bill question, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, it's my question. I, I've done a lot of work with SEPA, okay, in particular, but remember it's the Scottish government's consultation. So, um, but I do work a lot with SEPA and I did a big report for them recently where they asked me to give them a good understanding of how much slurry is produced, where it's produced, some of the pressures on the land base. So I can tell you that they've been asking some very specific questions about how much is being produced, what are the spreading activities, okay? So they've asked, they've stretched, they've asked the industry, what are you doing, okay? Um, the, the feedback I've got so far is, is the approach they've taken is going to be mainly about slurry storage, okay? So it's gonna be saying, we're going to put rules in that say you need to store, you need to be able to store. Okay. The difference between that and some of the NVZ rules is about close periods. And I, Hugh, I haven't seen anything that would indicate that they're going to go down the road of close periods. It certainly could have been an option. So in either combination with minimum storage requirements or in separately as a restriction, which would have forced people to, to store. So as near as I can tell now, there's, as there's not going to be anything that's going to prevent spreading in four years from now during winter, but it's not going to be encouraged. Let's put it that way, outside NVZs. Is that, is that correct, you? Do you agree with that? I would agree with that, Bill, yes. I think uh, from an NVZ point of view, I mean, obviously storing it, and because you are closed, you do have to store it, and you have to be mindful of what's going in your stores. And, and that, well, they were always the big uh, capital items that you had to when you were landed in an NVZ, but once you've got the storage, it does allow you to be a more efficient farmer because you've got that, then I say it, volume of slurry to spread when 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 you when you can at the optimum time. And you ably described that. At that is springtime when a growing crop can embrace and, and, and actually take on board all the nutrients like so. Yep. I'll just add to that. I've been involved in two programs where we monitored the impact of, of increase in slurry storage. Okay, so across the whole farming system. And in both cases, it transformed the business. Okay, really being able to have it changed it from a liability to an asset. Okay, so and that was mainly about effective investment in good slurry management technology, which Hughes covered quite well. But it can be transformational. It can change the whole business when you get it right. So that that that'll probably come down to a continuation of the funding that we've seen um, in the last funding room. Get that so people can work on getting that slurry storage in and that kind of thing. Um, we have. Another question then, um, uh, can you put 30 tonnes per hectare on in an NBZ and it's pig, sorry? Uh, well, I'll, 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 if it's pig, sorry, I've not got any pigs, so I can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> 30, 30 cube of pig slurry is a pretty healthy dose, okay? Yes. Um, you know, and and I'd, I'd be more concerned about the phosphate than I would be anything else. But I think you'd probably be, again, in that instance, you're, you're, what, we have, what we've covered today is fairly generic livestock production. You get into mm -hmm. pigs and poultry, you're starting to get extra rules coming into place, okay? In terms of storage requirements, so that'll be the proposed changes. But if you're in NVZ, you're already aware of that. Uh, but I would be wanting to, to do the calculation on paper to make sure you're compliant. Okay. Um, what are the potential downsides of slurry application in seedbed preparation, um, particularly for forage crops? Sorry, Seamus, what was that question again so, about? Uh, slurry application 
in seed bed preparation. Right. It's it's uh, it's obviously a that's on top of the well. I, I promote that for my maize growing. It's mm. basically on top of the plowing. So you're dragging the hose across the plowing. Yeah, you've got wheelings, but but equally so, you've got a dry soil there. And again, and given the weather conditions at the moment, it's very dry and now. That's adding moisture to that into that soil, but you have to leave it 24 hours at least, basically to percolate into the into the soil. And then your power harrow, you've you've got moisture, and your power harrow going in there will obviously mix that the soil and that, the nutrients that you've already applied. And then that's giving me this, in my mind, uh, uh, a very much a uh, fertile, rich soil to plant the seed of, of, of maize in. And uh, I plant, uh, I still promote a biodegradable film. So once you put that film over the top of the seed, then you it, the heat comes up straight away in the soil and that gets that seed grown. It's got moisture, it's got nutrients. Hey ho, is that not what I, every growing plant wants basically right at its disposal if you know what I'm saying Mike Nelson. That's my mindset Mike you know, so, yeah. so it's not, the, the, There's not too many downsides to it anyway. Um, I don't think so but, but but the guys obviously don't like it the contractor guys don't like it because they're actually they're having to work on a, on a on a seed bed that's had nutrients in the shape of slurry applied the day before but sorry I'm, I'm out to grow the best crop I can with the available nutrient bank I have and that's it's, it's an element of working with it and explaining your rationale. Yes, dragging a hose over a ploughed land, <laughs> depending on the type of soil, but I'm very favourable soil, sandy loams. If you had sharp stony material, that might be a, a, a different scenario. Yeah. And I see, I see Bill nodding now, so he probably knows where I'm coming from in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could, you're, you're really, this is, a, this also leads into the discussion about what exactly is precision technology in terms of spreading mm. to you. And I think that, um, you know, that's, you really have to be sensitive to your soil type, okay, in terms of your spreading and some of the flexibility that he's talking about there is very farm specific and field specific. So that making sure that you're assessing that at, that, at, the, at the gate is, is important prior to sort of, a, you know, those kind of approaches, because there, you, I think everyone needs to have it on there. And everyone needs to consider it, okay, everyone needs to consider, the, you know, it, is a change in practice the best approach now to increasing use of, of efficiency? But that has to be balanced with some practicalities. So, you know, what, what you can get away with down in uh, Dumfries will, will be very different than what a, a farmer up in, in air, air will be able to do. Steady, steady, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, that, that answer is probably one of the other questions that we had where um, it was someone just commented that a lot of the technologies that you talked about, you maybe weren't going to be applicable to the smaller dairy farm. Um, just it wouldn't it wouldn't scale down to that level maybe. Um, but we have one, a couple more questions. Um, we're closing in on nine o'clock now. Uh, there's one about carbon and is there less carbon emitted from a dribble bar than a splash plate? I, I can kind of dance around this topic if you want, Seamus. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's not so much the the, the carbon um, that, that we're concerned about with the use of splash plates. It's very much the ammonia um, that is uh, exposed to, to the atmosphere um, and trying to, to limit that um, and increase um, kind of direct soil contact. So um, mm. that that will be the, the main driving force behind the, the dribble bar, I would imagine. I think I think if you're if you're applying if you're applying your nutrients your your organic your slurry and you're getting making the most from the nutrients within that slurry then you're going to be offsetting the offsetting the fertilizer the emissions yeah. from fertilizer production so it, it it's a win win I think in that mm -hmm. um, side of things the final question now I think this this will be for you Bill will there be a relaunch of the planet recording system. I would hope so. Okay, I think if, if we're going to see it, we, we need to see a sort of refocus and interest in the nutrient management side of things. Okay, um, a lot of the Planet Scotland, I didn't mention it in the talk and I should have. Um, it's another tool that's available. The one reason I didn't um, include it is that because it hasn't been updated. So it's a computer based system, which can be very useful in terms of understanding slurry and its management at the farm level um, and at the field level too. But we haven't seen a, a program of updating it. So I would be slightly concerned that. If the, certainly if these legislative changes occur, we need to make sure that the tools that you use to show compliance are sympathetic with the regulation. 
Okay, and he will know that small changes in the NBZ rules over the years meant that all your guidance documents had to change. Okay, so we're moving away from best practice here to compliance. And so as we do that transition, okay, this is all assuming that this legislation is going to be accepted, which it may not, you do have the right to comment on it. So please do so. Um, but if it's adopted, we're going to be quickly moving away from good practice, accepted values to very regulated values. Okay, so we need to make sure that we're using that. And that's where a planet, I wasn't, you know, we'll need to see an upgrade so that it will, it will accu accurately reflect whatever environmental regulations are, are changing. Okay, but I certainly hope so. Yep. I think, I think that's us. Uh, there's a couple more questions, but I think we can get to them. We're, we're closing, we've gone past nine o'clock now, so I'm conscious of that. Uh, there's one final question just came in there now, and that's how can we access last week's webinar if we missed it? Um, and I believe they will be on the Farming and Water Scotland webpage yes. and possibly the Farm Advisory Service as well. Yeah, um, so, so we're, we're just coming to that, don't worry. Okay, I'll leave it up to you then. I'll let you close it out. Good, good stuff. Um, well, well, thanks, thanks very much, folks, for your for your questions. That that was really good. Um, if any more do come in, um, and obviously we we finished the Q and A session now, um, I'll be quite happy to to follow up in the next week, um, and uh, hopefully there'll be an opportunity to have our speakers back for our last event uh, for the for the fourth webinar uh, for our kind of open panel night. So, uh, yep, um, stay stay uh, stay up to date for that. Okay, um, so Bill kind of mentioned it at the very beginning there, but um, I felt it was important that, that we mentioned this again. It got a shout out last week, um, just so that you're all aware that there is the ongoing consultation um, on the, the potential changes for, uh, for sustainable slurry management in Scotland. Uh, and obviously Scottish government are upping the ante in terms of climate change policy. Uh, and it's really important that we get as many voices and as many opinions um, on, uh, on the proposed changes. So anybody interested in having their say should, uh, should get in touch and, and make, their, make their opinions known by the 13th of April, um, which is next week. And uh, for anybody who missed um, last week's webinar, um, there is now a recording of it, which can be found on Farming and Water Scotland. Um, the, the web link is there. Um, and just a breakdown of the rest of the events that we have coming up. Um, so next week, we'll be looking at store maintenance and farm safety with uh, SEPA's Stephen Field. Um, and we have a farm safety representative from, uh, from the NFU coming on to speak to us. So that, uh, that, that should be really good. Um, and finally, um, I mentioned at the beginning, this was a four part webinar series. So um, as uh, to, to round off the, the, uh, the webinar series, we'll be doing uh, an open panel night with some of the returning speakers from the series and um, taking your questions and looking at some of the innovative practices um, and uh, opportunities that have been taken by dairy farmers predominantly here in, in Ayrshire. Um, so anybody with any questions, uh, anybody who has had some time to reflect on some of the content and wants to come back and ask another question, you're, uh, you're more than welcome to, to join us in week three and four. Um, and obviously I mentioned the uh, Farming and Water Scotland. Um, please do get in touch, um, check out our, our, our content, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, um, and, uh, and by all means, take a look at the, the website. Um, and just a, a kind of overview of Farming and Water Scotland. This is the website. Uh, Farming and Water Scotland is a joint initiative between SAC Consulting and SEPA, um, supported by the Farm Advisory Service uh, and Scottish Government. Um, Hugh did plug um, some of the content that we worked on last year as part of the Farm Advisory Service, so I would encourage anybody who has a real interest in, in slurry management, and, and that will be a lot of you, I would imagine, um, to go onto the, the FAS.Scot website and uh, have a look at some of the content that we created in 2020 as part of our slurry management and application series. Um, and obviously, yeah, um, take a look at the, the content that we have um, on Farming and Water Scotland. Um, anybody who has seen the Know the Rules stickers, um, you, you'll know that uh, we, we have a range of content there and signposting for um, additional resources. 
All right. Um, so thanks very much for joining us, folks. Um, it's, it's been a really good night. I'd like to thank Bill Crooks and Hugh McClement again for joining us. And uh, thanks to, to Seamus for, for moderating those questions. Um, hope to see as many of you as possible here next week uh, for, for Stephen Field and the NFUS. Um, but uh, until then, have a good night and I wish you well. <laughs>